Alrighty, so um, I would love to understand what were your biggest takeouts from this morning in, or uh, before lunch uh, in terms of company culture? And they can be things that you have questions about as well. So uh, whatever you want to throw out. Yes. So it means every conversation, every time you celebrate, every time you don't celebrate, every time someone comes into your organization and you do a big welcome to our company, and every time you exit someone from the company and you don't even give them a leaving card or, a, or whatever. I mean, how many people here have a process for when people leave that is as effusive and, and in all inclusive as when people join? Most people, oh, you do. Most people don't, and that's the saddest thing that I see, because how you leave a company is as important as how you join a company. It's not just how you walk in this door into this office, into this room. It's how you leave that as well. So uh, fantastic! Thank you for sharing that, Jerome. moral, ethical, and actually for the business. Yep. Yeah, I mean, what we're looking to do is create an environment where we get rid of all of that toxic energy so that, you know, we have the conversation and get the right people on the bus um, so that you have the right types of people and they're opted in. So they have proactively decided to step onto the bus and take their position on the bus. Um, and if they are toxic, then they have got off the bus and you have removed them from the bus if they... Uh, still hanging on. So you're making sure that you've got the right people in the right places. Um, it's very much about finding what is good for the business. It's, it is around that, but you know we can talk about, okay, so you've got this thing and it's do the right thing. By whom? For what purpose? And that's one of the things that we'll go through. Because what we need to understand is it's great to have um, you know, the value written on the wall, uh, maybe they're in the toilet, who knows, they, they could be anywhere, but unless you're actually living them, and people know what living them means, then there's a real disconnect. So I often cite the one that says, you know, give 100%. But does that mean? Like, really, what does give 100% mean? To you, it might mean something it means to me. So for me, give 100% means between the hours that I'm actually physically in the office, I won't do Facebook, I won't look at anything else. I'm 100% committed and I'm focused. For someone else, give 100% means that they'll kill themselves on a weekend or they'll come in when they're sick. So we've got a disconnect my interpretation of what 100% is and their interpretation of what 100% is or do the right thing, my do the right thing. And so part of the clarity that we try to get with clients is to articulate what are those behaviours and the attitudes um, that you need people to have. And once you're all on that same page, you can start calling out the behaviours and start focusing on them rather than what you did wrong is one of those conversations that says, I'm curious, can you just help me understand how what we've just seen is demonstrating us living X value? So do the right thing, it's quite broad brush. Um, but once people have got a framework to understand what exactly that frame that means, then you can start actually living it. And you can start having conversations at a much higher level with your team, and they can be empowered much more to deliver and to to go along because they've got this guidance system they know what it is so they know what do the right thing means so they can do that so does that answer that question yeah, yeah? cool other feedback of what you picked out what you yes
-hmm. Yes. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and there's this big thing, I don't know if it, it's a phrase that people have heard, you know, hire for culture fit. There's something. I actually think that you should be recruiting for culture add. So are you culture additive? So are you there to expand and enhance and make the culture even better rather than just fit into what you've got existing? Now, if you don't have a great culture to start with, then your first order of you know, service should be um, to actually try to get in people that will, um, that will fit within the culture and get rid of people that, that don't. Frankly, there's some hard decisions to be made. There are some things that you would need to do. It doesn't matter how big you are, there's decisions to make. Who's, who's the right people to be on and off the bus? Uh, but then it's around how can we grow this culture and make it even better? Because it's the thing that differentiates you from everybody else in the market. You know, Jeff was talking about in real estate, it's actually, there's the same product. So, you know, we might be coaches with different experiences. We might have, um, I don't know, sports wear, and we, we sell different types of sports wear. So there's differentiation. But when you're talking as a real estate, actually the house that you're trying to sell is the same house. What differentiates you as a real estate agent? It's your culture. It's who you are and what you're being in the marketplace. Yes, you'll have sales techniques. Yes, you'll have... Um, you know, different marketing techniques that you'll use. They're the technical things, but it's the relationships that you build with your customers that make all of the difference. So this is just a quick one. So who likes the colour beige? I love the colour beige on walls at home. That's about it. So if you think that this is, this is your culture, and if I have a beige culture... And do you know what I mean when I say a beige culture? It's me too. Everybody's got the same culture. We've got, everybody says that their, their values are integrity and respect. You're like, okay, so what makes you different? You've got a beige culture, and what happens is you attract beige, and I hate the word staff, but I'm going to use it today, beige staff. So you don't stand for anything much. You're very similar to other people. So you get people that are very similar. They're, you know, not going to set the world on fire, but it'll do the job. Um, so we end up with beige staff. Now, beige staff provide a beige service. And you end up with, guess what colour they are? Customers. So you end up with beige customers. Again, they're okay. They're sort of bread and butter, but they're not going to set the world on fire. They'll probably order from you maybe once, maybe twice. But as soon as something prettier comes along, they're not going to be very loyal. So you've got beige customers. And beige customers give you beige profits. <laughs> so it's all very beige. It's average. It's kind of there. Yes? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if you're not particularly different, you're going to attract people who aren't really that bothered about it being different. They're more in it for a weekly paycheck and what they're going to get. They're not going to provide a woohoo service that everybody goes, wow, that was amazing. That was the iconic. They enabled me to send my stuff back. They were more like the waistcoat on Facebook that we had to send back to China. Guess how many more of those he's going to be buying, my other half? None. Um, so that reflects then in the profits. But if you turn that on its head, what colour would you like? Not beige. Any other colour? We might go for yellow today, because you know there's a bit of a bit of a yellow theme going on. But if you stand out, so this is what um, Sharon Pearson would call. Um, she's a lady that, that both Jerome and I know from training world. Is around um, disruptive leadership, and disruptive leadership means be different. Be different but be you. 
So being different is something that people go, you know what, I know exactly what you stand for. I know what your values are, and I like you. So we have this little thing that we want to be on every single shelf in the supermarket, just in case our ideal customer, which is a person breathing, walks past. But what disruptive leadership says is, be different, be you, and that will attract a certain type of customer. You'll be on a very specific shelf in the supermarket. So when someone who wants that specific thing, they want a high performance washing powder, they don't go to the egg aisle, but they will go to that section or it's organic food or whatever it is. Be different. So don't be beige, be yellow or red or pink or whatever color you are. Because then, guess what? People go, ooh, I'd really love to work for that organization. I love what they stand for. I love their values. And then what they'll do is they'll go above and beyond for the customer. So they will actually go on a Friday night and deliver some loan papers to someone or uh, when they're on the phone. Um, the, the young lady that popped into the lift with me on the way through, she'd only been here two days. And I said, so do you, are you enjoying working here? And she said, the people are lovely. And she then went out of her way and she said, oh, do you want me to go down to reception and ask them where the lift is, uh, where the stairs are? Because I've only been here for two days. Would you like me to do that? And I'm like, ooh, I kind of like that. So she went over and above that. So what's my impression of the Sage Hotel? Well, when I, when I arrived, they gave me a twin room and I'm such a princess. I w looked at this little tiny bed and I went, yeah, that's not really going to work for me because guess what? I'm not with my other half. I do this in bed. I starfish in bed. So my experience was I had something that wasn't quite 100%, um, but they fixed it. And they took my bag to the new room when I was here, and I didn't have to worry about it. So it doesn't mean that everything is always going to be rosy and there's going to be things that screw up, but I'm not going to have beige customers. You're going to attract people who are high, you know, high performers and... Um, they spend more, more often, all those sorts of things. So you get better customers, which leads to better profits. And it all foods back into your culture. So it becomes this virtuous loop. So I have no idea how I got onto that part of that conversation. <laughs> but definitely creating a culture. And um, I stole this off someone's table. It must have been yours. Is it your book? I've tried not to crack the spine. But there was a piece. So I don't know. Does anybody else do this? They open a book and just see what it lands on. And this particular thing um, saw me. Uh, we should lead like a strawberry, not like a watermelon. We should be the same on the outside as we are on the inside. Deep. Um, that is also how we should... <laughs> how, tasty. Uh, how we should be as our culture. Because there's people that have all of these things that go, wow, we've got this amazing culture. And guess what? We've got a foosball table and we've got, you know, bean bags and we've got all of these things. And you see the people leaving those organizations and going, that's it. That was the worst experience I've ever had. So we're talking about, you know, connecting you to an actual vision, to an authentic version of you, not trying to create a culture that's not you. It's about being who you are on the inside as well as who you are on the outside and being authentic to that so people can see who you are. That makes sense. Hopefully that landed. So any other feedback from this morning? Other thoughts that it engendered, questions that you might have? The glass box. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, culture, you know, we talk about it, it starts from the top down. We hear, I've had the conversation outside with, sh with Shah. And the analogy, I don't, I don't know if you've all heard of it, but it's like the, the fish rots from the head down. 
So your culture is set by the people at the top of the organisation. I actually prefer to have a culture that is, yes, they can set the tone at the top, but then it's bottom up and everything in between so that it's lived throughout every layer. So it's authentic and it's authentic to everybody that's in there. My preferred analogy, which I shared earlier, is culture is like a chocolate fountain. If that brown, runny stuff at the top isn't pure chocolate, it's not going to be pure chocolate at the bottom. And we've seen that with the banking crisis. So if that runny stuff at the top... I mean, they were basically saying, we're going for profits, we're going for you know quarterly earnings. 22 million, I think, the NAB guy was getting in bonuses. Guess where his focus was? So he was the brown, runny stuff, not so good at the top. And that's why you were seeing what it was at the bottom was not so good. And yes, it is scary. Uh, we... You know, we like what we feel is safe, what we can control. We l it's Unfortunately, we have a bit of a scarcity mindset. So which shelf in the supermarket am I going to put myself on? The riches are in the niches, as they say in the States, but niches. The riches lie there by being very specific, by being disruptive, by being different. However, we're all like, oh, but, you know, I'm going to miss all of these things. Um, it's, it's around creating a culture that's authentic and it's you. And when that glass box happens, they've actually already seen it all because it's authentically you and you're doing the right things in your organisation. Anything else that floated to the top? Yes. Yeah, and look, you know, it's wonderful to have lots of people, you know, decisions by committee. Who's ever experienced a decision by a committee that's actually worked? Now, we all want to have our voices heard, uh, but one person has to make the decision at the end of the day. And sometimes that's, of course, not necessarily going to be as popular as it is with other people, but giving people a voice and not a vote. And so when we talk about uh, creating your company culture, you've got one already. You can be a one-man band, you have a culture. You have a culture at home, in your family. You have a culture, again, we're, Danielle's going to come up a bit later, but we were talking, um, there is a swimming pool, is a swimming pool or an ocean pool? And she says each ocean pool has its own culture. And at different times of day, the culture changes. So it could be the oldies who are you know, going down there for a completely different reason than the people who are just keeping to their swim lane. So culture will be different, and we all have a culture. So um, I know some of the stats that I've put up, you know, 41% of people are like this and 60% of people are like that. Those are people, yes, those have come from bigger organisations, but we all have a culture, and you have a culture in your family right now. You have a culture in your circle of friends. You have a culture in your individual business. As one solopreneur, as one person running a business, as much as anything else. And the thing to focus when you've got fewer people is not so much how is my culture impacting my employees and how can I get the right employees on and off the bus. It's wha what is my culture and therefore how is that affecting my clients, my customers and their experience. So um, I do have a few more slides, but one of the things that I, this is how I look at culture. I look at, the first thing is culture. What is it that I want my business to represent? What is it that it stands for? And we can go through some of the elements that sit within that, but we've got values, standards, behaviours, those sorts of things. The next thing that I need to look at is actually the team. And getting the right people on or off the bus, we had a conversation earlier about, I prefer it to be a, a rowing boat. Um, everybody picks up an oar and they start rowing. Because with a, with a bus, you have passive passengers who are just going wherever you go. And I would prefer everybody to get up and start rowing and, and start getting in the same direction. Both have valid, valid parts to it. So you create the culture that you want, that is authentic to you and your values. You then look at the team, get the right people on and off the bus, get them to pick up an oar and start rowing, um, and do that so that they are co-creating. They have authority to, to co-create the culture because it's every single interaction, it's every hello, it's every goodbye, it's all of those. And then what you need to do is business, is attune the business. Now, what do I mean by that? 
Uh, if you are all into natural therapies and wonderful abundance and all sorts of things for people, if you are in an airless room, no windows, I have worked in one of those offices, it's completely different. The mindset of your employees will be completely different. So one thing can be, what's your physical environment? Uh, I, as I said uh, earlier, I run these uh, monthly, I call them culture bites. So I take a full day immersion talking about company culture, chunk it down into bite-sized pieces, and we get industry leaders together to talk about company culture. Now, what I am very, very careful to do in those uh, days is I look at every single part of their experience. And one of the things that I do is say, you know, I want this to be an environment that is enriching. So I actually hold them in office spaces of companies who have great culture that you can feel as soon as you walk in to the office. You can feel how great it is. So that's one of the aspects. That's your physical culture. Because if I held it in a nameless hotel, and I'm talking purely about culture and the experience that you create for people, it would be very, very different. <laughs> it, would, it wouldn't quite work. So physical environment, but then it's also the systems that you put in place. That's also your business. So how are you rewarding your teams? How, what are you focused on? What are your KPIs? If you're literally about getting bums on seats, you can have a very different focus than what I'm looking at is to create a great experience for people that interact with us. So you've got to look at what are your structures, the banks. They were very much focused on dollar signs of loan values. And what one of my friends did, he was managing one of those uh, portfolios, is he flipped that and he said, how many people have we helped into a new home? Now, the commitment that he got from his team was very different when he aligned and attuned the culture that he wanted to create, the mindset of his team with that structure, and that, that was their focus, was about putting people in, in, in their next home. So he had people on his team that would drive out of their way on a Friday night to deliver loan documents. If they were purely focused on how many dollar signs have we sold this week, they wouldn't have got that extra mile, that extra input and all of those things. So you need to look at the business and how you're physically integrating uh, this service element on here as well. So you've got the service that you're providing to your customers. So it's one thing, what are you focusing on, but also what, what service are you providing for your customers? So once you've done that, and people talk about alignment. And I always think alignment's very kind of, up, it's a linear, it's a linear process. So what I like to do is the sweet spot that's in the middle of all of this is attunement. And I can't fit in on, so I'm going to have to spend it on two. Um, unless everybody and everything that you do is attuned, you can be the best orchestra in the world and you can all have the same music, but if you don't start at the same time, then you're still going to make a noise, you're going to make a racket. You could be the best orchestra leader in the world, but unless everybody's on the same page, physically of their, their notes, they are going to just make a noise. So look at your culture, decide who you are and who you're gonna be that differenti differentiates you in the marketplace. But it's gotta be authentically you, be the strawberry, not the watermelon. <laughs> then look at your team and are they the right people that are gonna uphold those values? help them identify and co-create the behaviours that will enable your culture to sustain itself. And we're not talking about buying foosball tables and those sorts of things, they're short term. This is around how people feel, it's the emotional culture that you create in your business. They'll look after your customers, which is what we want, um, and then your business, attuning that so that you've got the right things that support the culture, the team, and everything else that you do. So that's your three parts to creating your culture, your team, and your business so that everything works together. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Yes, Jerome. Mm -hmm. 
it's not so much looking at the business model, though you may need to tweak the business model, but it's very much, you, could, you, know, you can start here and go, look, I'm going to get everybody into a membership and I'm going to charge them you know, X amount per month. Great. Okay, but how do you want people to feel? How do you want people to interact with that? How do you want the people who are then uh, servicing those, those customers, you could be on your own, so maybe the, the team is you, how are you doing it? And then coming back around, back into your business. So you need to be overlaying all of these things onto everything that you're doing all the time. Your culture is paramount. It's the thing that makes the difference. It's the nice runny chocolate, not the runny other stuff for your organization. So, y you know, if you've got an existing business and you've got an existing framework in mind, then run it through the model of looking at, okay, so what is our culture? What do we stand for? And then tweaking parts of that business model. So, you know, if, if your business model is, say, it's, you know, 12 months and whatever, what's your refund policy like? How hard or easy is it for people to come back to you? How quickly do you answer emails, pick up the phone, return calls? What's your culture? What is it that you stand for? That's all the things that sit within this, the service elements that you give to your customer that make things completely different. Any questions on that? Does that, does that kind of flip? Yes. 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 Right. What does everybody else thing think? Yep. So it's almost enforced fun. Like, you know, you have to like, <laughs> Well, if nobody's enjoying it and they're all just there going, oh my God, and I really don't want another freaking cake because I'm watching my weight and I'm like I'm on body trim or whatever it might be. <laughs> Um, you know, it can actually be detrimental. So working out with your team, okay, I would ask them the question. Uh, you know, my perception is we don't, we're not really enjoying ourselves during these sessions. You know, we would like to acknowledge each other that it's, it's their birthday and have an opportunity for everybody to get together. But what would that look like for us if we were authentically being us? And we're not trying to be the watermelon because everybody does birthday cakes and everybody's like, oh, I don't want to do another one of those. So I would definitely ask the question to get them, your team, to co-create, well, how do you want to celebrate this? And maybe they just don't. Maybe they don't. But what you don't want to do is push people so that they're not interacting at all. You do want them to create that trust and environment where they are being not just business-minded um, so that they're getting to know each other on a one-to-one basis. And I would probably be working on uh, more of the, the team aspect of that, for them to know each other as individuals. Because it sounds like they're working on quite surface level, potentially, very comfortable talking about on business and having those ideas, but they don't really know each other. They don't really, really know each other.
Mm. Yeah, and that builds the bonds of trust. There's, there's things that we think that we should be doing. Like, it's your birthday, we should be buying you a cake and we go through the motions and it's like everybody at one point thought we have to have fun and therefore we'll enforce what that fun is. And really understanding who the people are in your team and getting them to bond beyond the surface level, which is very important that they're having the work conversations and that's fantastic that you've got that level of trust with them, that they're, they're open to having that banter and dialogue on a work level, but just getting them to peel back those layers. And it may take a while um, to get them in. And you said they're accounting type, so the behavioral type that they are um, doesn't necessarily lend itself to, you know, they're not all salespeople who talk for a living. They, they are more considered, more guarded, um, potentially. They're not all going to be. Um, but find out what makes them tick rather than trying to prescribe, oh, and this is something that we feel that we ought to do rather than we something we want to. And you will actually add to your culture by taking away something that almost feels like, in, I'm going to say enforced fun, but you know what I mean. So hope that, that helps. Were you going to say something as well? <laughs> I'm very spiritually psychic. Can you imagine me playing poker? No. Oh, you could play poker. Would you be very good at it? Mm. Yes. does yep mm. Steve you uh, Taki's program where he has his BAs is that yeah so as I understand it Taki has uh, an environment where he has it's a uh, does anybody know Taki more um, so he has an extended program of um, VAs and um, he uses them extensively with his business. So Taki has very much established what his culture is and it pervades everything that he does to how casual he is. Uh, when he's on stage, he doesn't even wear shoes. Like he literally will walk around bare feet and he will, um, hi his uh, videos are done down the beach and he talks to people very uh, low key. It's not, you know, sir, madam, or even, you know, your name. It's no good day, rock star. Um, and he, his culture pervades through everything that he does. He will send you a one word email. Are you in? Oh, that two, two words. Are you in? Three words. Um, that will be his style. It's very laid back. And what he does with his VAs, as I understand it, is he calls it. I was going to say it's not his war counselor, but it's something like that. Um, and he takes. Sorry. Tribal council. And he takes all of his VAs, puts everybody in the same environment, and he spends a whole day with them talking about the culture of the organization, not about how to be a better VA, how to do a better job. He literally puts everybody together and does that on, a, I think it's an annual, but maybe quarterly basis? Annual. 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 Right. Yep. Yeah. 
Perfect. So it's an option, if you think it's viable, to make sure that when you're creating your culture that you're including everybody that is going to impact your culture. Um, and I'm not suggesting that you fly customers and things like that together, but at least have the opportunity to, for your team, and it's your extended team, to experience and understand what it is that you are doing. And that's exactly what you know, I do for a business, is work with people to understand what their culture is. Understand who they are and what they want to stand for and how to stand out in the marketplace. Attune their team and have those conversations. And how do you build that beyond the technical skills that everybody needs to bring them into the fold? Because how do they translate your culture? And how are they interacting? And what are the standards, behaviours, the expectations that you have that they can then buy into and get onto the bus with or not on the bus with? Does, does that help? Let's just put an extra couple of dollar signs on your expenses, but it's worth it when everybody's attuned. Mm. Mm -hmm. Your archetype. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I want to say, be the strawberry, not the watermelon. So we're trying to be you know, like this big hero and we're going to save the world. But if that's not really who you are, you won't authentically be providing that service and the whole thing will come down. So it's finding out who you are. Um, so one of the pieces uh, I sort of mentioned earlier, I did this training, uh, which is all around discovering what your archetype is. And then you engage with that. So that's in all of your branding, it's all of your marketing. Um, so my, um, my lead archetype, and archetypes are literally a, a story. So if I say the word hero, you've immediately got a story and a picture that comes up in your head and you, you have a vision of what a hero looks like. If I say sage, we're in the sage hotel, you've got a, a immediately an image of what a sage is and a story that goes with it. Innocent, an innocent archetype. Again, you've got a story and an image in your head. And so it's very much about understanding what your archetype is. This avatar is your customer, and that's who your ideal customer is. But your archetype is the other side of it to understand who you are, so then how you communicate. They need to match. They need to dovetail in with each other. So um, some of the, to just to bring that bit to life a bit more, um, if you think of, if you've seen the Jeep Cherokee adverts where it's all around getting out and it's in the wild and it's, you know, getting mud all over the place and you're in, by the day you're suiting and booted and by the evening you're, you know, you're out in the middle of the wilds. The archetype for that is very different from, say, Coca-Cola, who whilst as an underlying organisation we might not think of them as, but are the innocent archetype. I don't think Coca-Cola is particularly innocent. Just my thoughts on sugar. Um, but they want to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. And the innocent archetype is all about bringing people together and about oneness and the delight of being childlike and those sorts of things. Once you understand what your particular archetype is, are you the revolutionary? Are you the one that's going out and changing the world? Are you the hero that's, that's there with the cape on, you know, protecting everybody, going out and delivering food, uh, you know, saving the world? For me, my archetype is, uh, my top one is, arch uh, is creator. And so I, I understand now, ah, I help people create all of this world and then help them bring all of those elements to life. It's why when I run my uh, full day immersions, I look at every single little aspect of the experience that the customer has because I create this vision and then implement it. So very much looking at what's your archetype, your authentic archetype not trying to be something that you're not. There's 12 different archetypes, and I can share some more information if you want to. I can email you and share you that. There's some 
yeah, there's some profiles and things like that that you can do to understand what it is. Excellent. Anything else that's kind of popping out? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and I think I walked in yesterday when they were talking about um, different cultures that say yes to everything. You know, you ask the question, and they go, yes. And then you ask them, did you understand that? And they go, yes. And then when they do it, and you're like, what did you just do? But it's the culture to not, it, it's rude to say no. They say yes because it's rude to say no. So how do you do that with multiple cultures? And I think one of the ways of doing that is having a great story. Now, um, it, it beautifully segues into one of the items that I, I wanted to share with you. But to have a, a, a story, a culture story that translates culturally, so lots of different organizations, uh, lots of different countries and people from different backgrounds can buy into. Uh, we talked about having the bus and having the right people on or off the bus. It's a visual that people can understand having the innocent archetype, the revolutionary, all those things. It's something that you can immediately, yes, I understand what that is. And has anybody heard of a company called Incentra? Incentra. They, are, they do IT type stuff. And Ronnie, if he ever sees me do this talk, he's going to go, you should know exactly what our company does because he's a good friend of mine. Um, and became a good friend of mine after he was one of my speakers at my summit, uh, at my immersion. And what he has done is he has created a metaphor, a story that every single person on his team can, without hesitation, talk through. So it translates across different organizations. He's in um, America, he's in the UK, he's in Australia, he's in Asia, and they all get on board with this one story. So are you happy if I share what his culture story is? And he uses it when he onboards people, and he uses it when he offboards people. And what they have is the Incentra, and I can send you a link as well to the story. He's written it all up as a blog post. Um, the Incentra train. So the metaphor goes that we have this train, and the person at the front of the train who decides how fast they're going, which tracks, uh, whether they stop at a station or just blow straight through, that's Ronnie. Ronnie is the CEO, and he's at the front of the train. But every other carriage that's attached to that engine room or to that, that front part of the train, um, all the doors are open. So anybody who's at the back of the train can walk all the way through to the front of the train and have a word with the guy who's deciding which directions that they go in. Also down the train, you have people who are busy shoveling coal in, so it's an old-fashioned train, shoveling coal in, and that's the people who are in the engine room. They're the people that are keeping it going. And at any time, if you're in any of the other carriages where the doors are open and you can see that you need a little bit more fuel than everybody is getting in and asking each other, can I help you put this you know, extra coal on the fire? So they've got this whole analogy that says, you know, when you get on, you need to get on board the Incentra train. This is how we work. We work together. Everybody's responsible for helping each other. And they'll have a conversation when somebody maybe shouldn't be in the team any longer. And they will talk about getting off the train. Maybe this is time for you to get off the train. And whether they slow down at the station is up to you is how pretty or how bad you want to make it. I think that might be a twist that I've added to that. Um, but they talk about the Incentra train, getting on board, going a part of the journey, helping each other, making sure that you are on board with wherever they're going. If you decide at any point that you want to get off, then they will slow down the train and you can disembark. This isn't like a job for life where you're having to do this if you don't believe in, this, in the journey that they're going on. So they actually have this one story that they share over and over and over again. And people decide at any point in their journey with Incentra to get on, get off, get on, get off. Um, and make sure that it's a, a pleasant experience for everybody.
So having that one story, that one metaphor for your culture, they talk about having a pebble in the shoe, not quite related to the train, but one of the things that they ask people to do is if you've got a pebble in your shoe, talk about it now. Because what you don't want is to be limping along with a massive blister when we could have just stopped and picked this little tiny pebble out and dropped it to one side. So having all of those sorts of metaphors that they use with people to bring their values to life. So if that helps, that may be a way of translating across and you saying about you've got VAs in different countries or you know people that are in different countries. Um, that's a way of explaining it. And it's also a way of explaining it to your customers. You know, be front and center with these things. They should be on your website. They should be on where everybody can see them. I went to a client once, and uh, I was talking to some of his team, and he was in the accounting world. And I said, oh, so you know, what are your values? And he said, oh, I don't know. I only get them out once a year when I do a performance review. I was like, oh, my God. Or uh, another company actually had them written on the wall. But could, were they living them? Did they know what they were? Nobody knew what they were. So n one of the other things I'd like to just address is about about values. I just won't go into lots and lots of details for them. Do you know what your company values are? You do? You know what they are? Do you know what yours are? Yeah? Do we all know what our company values are? Do you live them? Do you love them? Okay. So my challenge with people is that quite often, there's, so there's four different types of values. So um, we either have our core values, where there should be about core values. Um, mm, there's a difference, three to five. Three to five core values. Some people have a list of 20. And it's like, really? You're never going to live all of those, but just have a core. So they're your core values, and they're the ones that play out every single day. But what people also have are aspirational values. So they're the ones that they think they have, but they actually don't. They're the ones that they are going towards. So they actually have aspirational values. Then you have accidental values. This is where we said earlier, mind the gap. Your accidental values are things that come by virtue of the actions that you take every day that aren't necessarily in line with your culture. So accidental values come about, uh, we've got a, an idea scheme. We have something, we're going to be big on innovation, we're going to get all this, the team together and they're going to come up with some amazing ideas. And what happens to those ideas? Nothing. They go into a box and nobody does anything with the ideas. The accidental value isn't innovation, it's not actually a core value. Their accidental value is that actually nothing that you do really, really matters and that you don't have a voice. So the reality is very different. You've accidentally got a value of don't care. That is the value. But it's not the value that you think it is because it's accidental. It becomes the norm. Values your culture is the norm. It's the way things are done around here. Uh, a badge of honor for coming in sick. We talk about you know health and wellness in the workplace and wanting to look after everybody. And then you give people a hard time if they're off sick. Well, you've got an accidental value that isn't health and wellness by any stretch of the imagination. You've got an accidental value of kill yourself whilst you're here on our behalf. So you've got core values, aspirational values, accidental, and then the last one is what I see a ton of is permission to play values. What does that mean? That is the lowest standard that you should have as an organization to be able to be in business. How many companies do you see who have respect, honesty as their values? And you're going, surely... You shouldn't be allowed to play unless you have respect and honesty. Yes, I'm going to do business with you because one of your values is dishonesty. It, it's not going to happen. So it should be your, m this is your minimum viable product <laughs> of what you are going to do as a business. So we need to make sure that whatever values you have are sitting up here and they're in that core values area. And the other thing I like to do is to make sure that your core values are doing words. 
more active. So um, how do you describe them and how do you get people to remember them? Uh, I don't know if anybody's had a quick peek at my website. Um, and there are different ways of doing this. This won't suit everybody. But if you imagine flexibility as a, a, a value, that's one that's, that's mine. You won't necessarily find that word big in front and center on my website. What you will see is this phrase. People mistake us for Russian gymnasts. We're agile, flexible, and we always nail the landing. That's flexibility for us. That is about changing, adapting. Be it brings the word to life. It brings it with so much more meaning. Um, growth. Nice. We believe in, you know, always learning and all those sorts of things. So the value that we have doesn't say growth. It says uh, our other favorite color is green. We're either green and growing or ripe and dying. And we're all around learning and challenging ourselves and challenging our clients to grow. So we use words that will enable us to articulate in a way that sets us apart from other people, our values. So we don't just have that single word, honesty, trust, those sorts of things. Um, say it all, say it now. That's one of our others. So that's about honest, transparent, communication. We are upfront and we say what we mean and we mean what we say and if we wa need to have a co difficult conversation, we do it. My personal values are courage, passion and playfulness and that comes out in my business. If I'm not passionate about it, if I don't really, really love it and really want to do it, I think what's the point of getting out of bed? courage. It's about having those difficult conversations. It's about putting yourself into those uncomfortable places and giving things a go. Like none of us know what's going to happen, but if you don't give it a go, then you just won't know. And playfulness is around don't take yourself too seriously. Like none of us are getting out of this alive. I, know I don't want to spoil the ending, but none of us actually get out of this. We might come back again. I don't know, but you know, it's, it's those sorts of things. So being front and center with your values, bringing them to life, having stories, uh, things that translate, that will enable your customers to opt in. I love the way that you talk. I love the way that you are so different. You're a breath of fresh air in the market compared to every other real estate agent or every other charity or every other, you know, whatever, it, air conditioning. It's you that makes the difference. It's not the widget. It's not the thing. It's how well you do it and it's why you do it that makes the difference. So we talked a lot about why uh, over the last couple of days. Does that make sense? I'm hoping that you would go back and just go, I need to get creative. And so for some people, I understand that's going to be a challenge because that's not necessarily. So, you know, finding your buddies, finding other people to spark those ideas. But again, it's got to be authentic. So, you know, if you're not a Russian gymnast, that isn't going to suit you as a business. So don't be writing down that you're going to be a, a Russian gymnast. Um, be the watermelon. Don't be the watermelon. Be the, be the, um, the strawberry. Or what else is like it? See, even a banana is different, aren't they? They're different on the inside from the outside. So um, how much more do we... We've got about 15 minutes. Okay. Um, I can go through this relatively quickly, and this is, is there, are there other questions and other things that have kind of come out that you, did I hear a noise? She's going answering a phone at the back. <laughs> okay, so who knows what their, um, and I don't know if this is going to, like something that Steve will go, oh God, don't, don't talk about that. Um, but who has a vision statement? Have you got a vision statement? Okay. Okay. Uh, did you find it easy to craft? Did you find that an easy process? Ooh. Okay. Yep. 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 Great. Cool. 
Fabulous. Um, do you have a mission statement for your business as well? Have you got vision, mission, values? Yeah, they have to be authentic, and so it comes out of living the business. You can't sit there at the front and just go, I'm going to have all of these values. It's because then they turn into one of the four types. Yeah, turn into one of those four. Yeah. 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 So just like having um, a business plan, people get told, you must have a business plan. And um, Shah uh, admitted, like, you know, I'm an alcoholic. Um, uh, admitted that she hasn't have uh, had a business plan. Um, do you guys all have business plans? Do you all have vision and mission statements and all those sorts of things? How connected are you to them? How could you and any of your Im teams and those sorts of things, could they actually say what those are? I struggle with it personally. So this is something that I use, which um, you may or may not want to take on board. Um, when we do the startup world, they don't have business plans. They have a business canvas. And so they literally have the headlines of the things that they're looking at, at doing. Um, one of the ways of trying to describe what it is that you do as a business to other people and what's your why and your purpose for being a business, instead of having a, a vision and a mission and people go, what the hell's the difference between those two and I don't really understand and I'm not really connected to it, um, we have this other thing which I think I'm not sure it's on my slides. Um, we look instead at purpose, impact, and way. My purpose is a business, the impact that I have outside in the world, and the way that we do it. Sorry, I've just done those the wrong way around. Purpose, way, and impact. Shoot. Purpose, way, and impact. So uh, purpose, the way that we do it, and then the impact that it has on the environment. Oh, I'm like, those letters don't seem to, to work for me. So um, the key thing for this, if you have any of those elevator pitches, you have any of those where you go into, what is it that you do for a business? And you can have those, those shorts, pithy, this is what we do, but people, getting people to understand why you're doing what you're doing. What's the problem that you're actually solving? Uh, for people, how you do it, and then the impact that that actually has on people. So I think I do have, um, uh, so yeah, start a revolution, not a company. Um, so vision, mission, purpose uh, in there. Then you've got values, standards, attitudes, behaviours. We've, we've sort of brushed on those. I can give you the, all of this stuff. So these are how you're actually going about and living the values and living those sorts of things. And then after that, changing your vision, mission, and values into purpose, uh, way, and impact. And she says, okay, so vision, a vague statement of the future, to be the world's leading. How many times have you seen that? Our vision is to be the best in the world. We're the world leaders. We're, we're doing all those sorts of things. Relatively vague, high, high um, chunk level. The mission is then around the product, services, and corporate objectives. You know, the, our mission is to do X, Y, and Z. And then the values, a list of, you know, as we said, me too. So this is an example of um, FedEx. So you know FedEx, the, the career delivery uh, place in the States. So their um, values are around people, service, innovation, integrity, responsibility, loyalty, safety. Ooh, yeah, that's really exciting. Uh, their mission. Will uh, FedEx Corporation will produce superior financial returns for its shareholders by providing high value added logistics? Oh my God, I cannot even tell you what all of that says. 
It is so boring. Who's connected to it? Are the employees able to say what the mission of the company is? And then lastly, leading the way. Where they're leading the way to? No freaking idea, but they're leading the way. That's the old version of vision and mission and values. So the, the um, Purpose, Weight and Impact, PWI, tries to look at this from a slightly different angle. And they do put the letters in the right order, so that's always helpful. So Purpose, Weight and Impact. Um, I don't know why I'm leaning down using that. Um, simply state the change that you're trying to bring about in the world. What is the change that you're trying to do? And I know that you're looking at me going, how am I changing the world with air conditioning? But we'll get there. Uh, focus on the unique ways in which you make it happen. And then finally, look at, say, how it will make the world and people's lives better. So if I give you the same FedEx version, this potentially could be um, their version of it. So their purpose is to enable any person or organization to conduct a physical transaction anywhere in the world with speed and absolute dependability. So their purpose is very clear. We can buy modern transportation logistics, information technology with an attitude of whatever it takes to keep a promise. So they're bringing in their values in the way that they do it. They absolutely, whatever it takes to keep a promise. That's one of their standards that they use. And the impact that they have when every organization or individual can conduct global commerce, communities flourish and lives improve. Now, there's still a lot of words there. There's still a lot of words there. My purpose is to create great places to work. The way that I do that is I work with companies through all-day immersion, through coaching, through culture bites, whatever it might be, um, to help them to attune their culture, their, bus their team, and their business. And the impact that makes is on the bottom line and also the ripple effect that that has for the employees, their customers, and the rest of the communities around them. It's such an easier thing to say than say, my vision is to be the leading organization that is going to change this and this and this. So the purpose, way, and impact is a very easy way of helping communicate your story. So if you remember the building blocks that we had before, where it was compelling uh, emotional engagement was right at the top, that was about storytelling. And all of these things are a way of being able to tell your authentic story instead of going by the book and having a vision statement, a mission statement, some values that are all me too, and you're completely beige, 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 beige. Yes. Yes. So um, this isn't actually FedEx's um, actual piece, this is putting their business through this model. So they don't actually translate that, they haven't adopted this. This is, if you did a purpose, way and impact study with them, this is the type of experience words that you would have instead. How you would translate it is making sure that this is on all of your materials that you have going out, it's how your, your team talk about what it is that you do. It, it will inform all of the standards that you have for all of your business. Um, whether it's written on the back of your pamphlets, you know, purpose, way, and impact. The purpose of our organization is to make sure that everybody can live in a, a great, cli I don't know, great in climate in their home. The way that we do that is to deliver superior service for X, Y, and Z, and the impact that we have is that everybody's, I don't know, I don't know what yours would be, but you, comfort, yeah, so comfort. So the impact that you have on people, because when people have comfort in their home, then whatever that might be, that, that next statement. So is that something that you think you might be able to, to work out? What's your purpose? What's the way that you do something that is unique for you? What is it that th is the you that you bring to the way that you do things? And then the wider impact that you have on, on people. And your purpose can be anything from understanding what your origin story was. You know, why did you start your business in the first place? And I know yours was, it, it wasn't so much you woke up one day and said, I'm desperate to be a, <laughs> an air conditioning engineer. But it was, it was more of an evolution, wasn't it, as I understand it.
following footsteps, yeah. So the origin story quite often gives you a clue as to why you started, because quite often you start a company because you see an issue, you see, see something in the market, and you go, that's broken, I want to fix it. I want to do this. This drives me nuts. My origin story is I worked for a, a company that had gone from being an amazing place to being a shitty place, and I decided that I did not want anybody else to ever be inflicted with Clive. Clive, who was actually this tall person, I'll just let you know. Uh, another thing that helps you with your purpose is what is wrong in the world that we cannot accept and want to change through our work? What is it that makes you get out of bed every single day? Because there's got to be something. There's something that's either going right in the world or there's something that's going wrong in the world, and that's the thing that fires you up and makes you want to do it. You know, you've got people that are charging way too much for air conditioning out there, that are making people wait for 20, you know, two years to even get their, their stuff sorted. There's going to be that passion of some reason why you want the things to be different, things to be different in the world. Um, the, the why questions, which is what Char was going through with you all. So what do we do? And then ask the question, why is that important? Okay, so then why is that important? And then why is that important? Uh, so keep asking me the goes. Um, how would you answer your grandchild who asks, tell me why you spend so much time at work? That will help you bring out what the purpose of what you're trying to do. Some of these things are about just going on a rant, are just about writing down what it is. I was most proud to work here when, tell a story about a moment when you're proudest of the company that you work for and why. And list the ways that you actually make others' lives better through your work. So how we contribute to the lives of others. And that will all help you distill what your purpose is and then you will work out the way that you do it is how you are different to people in the marketplace. And the impact that you have, that is the most valuable resource, that is the most valuable thing as business owners, is the impact that we have on the world. It's the legacy that we leave behind. And if you can communicate that to people, communicate that to your teams, communicate that to your external teams and to your customers, that's how you will be the unicorn, the purple unicorn, whatever it is that we now need to be these days to be different and to be that disruptive leader who is happy to stand front and centre, proud of their culture and attract the opposite of beige clients, beige customers, beige profits, profits and beige team members. So um, that's it for me. We have a couple of minutes for questions based on that. And I apologies, I did have to rush through that last bit a little bit more. But I have worksheets that I can give to you um, so that you can go through the purpose, way and impact piece. It's a whole workshop that I run for a whole day with clients to help them really nut it out individually. But I can give you some guidance on that. And the other thing that you've actually got in your book um, is a culture audit, effectively, that I give to clients. It's what I like to call my oh shit audit. Because people think, I've got a great culture, and then they start reading through it and start going, mm, actually, I didn't think about this. And it takes you through culture, teams, and business. So all those different areas to help you think, okay, I can't answer yes to that question, so what action can I take? So if you want anything else, uh, any more insights, feedback, anything from this, I'm more than happy to, uh, to connect and have that conversation. Um, yes. All right. Big round of applause for Julie. Thank you.